The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Welcome to On the Mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. We are live from the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament at Prairie Lynx Golf and Event Center, as always, with Andy Hamilton, the pride of track wrestling. Proud as a peacock. You got your NBC Sports hat on. Looks good. The power of the peacock. I like that hat. You got to be proud for working for NBC Sports. Absolutely. That's a great thing to have. I mean, you got the, the biggest company in the world behind your product. Has to feel good. It does feel good. Feels great, Kyle. <laughs> it does. It should Bart, feel great. Always throw on in the old Bart Scott yeah. interview. I, if no one's seen that, you need to just take the time <laughs> to go see the Bart Scott interview with Sal Palantonio, I think it yeah. is. Yeah. And, yeah. and maybe even type in Remix and YouTube. It's well yeah. worth the time. Yeah. You showed it to me for the first time. I hadn't seen it. Now I've seen it probably conservatively 50 times. I've watched it because of you. I would take the over on that. I think you and I have watched it 50 <laughs> to times together. It's so it's worth every second of it, and it's worth it to be on this podcast because we're going to have some great guests. We are in the wings with Brad Smith coming up. He was an NCAA champion for the University of Iowa in 1976. Just broke Bob Siddons' record of 11 state championships, traditional state team championships in the state of Iowa. He now has 12. That's the record now. Bob Siddons, the legend that coached Dan Gable all those years, coached at Waterloo West High School. It's going to be fun to catch up with Brad Smith and a multitude of other people at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament. But you are seeing this from an outside perspective. You just see all the names coming in and out. We had a rain delay. It's pretty cool to see four four four-time state champions walking around, pro football players, Olympic gold medalists. Pretty special. Yeah, and I'm happy we got the chance to catch up with Brad. Brad was the first... I was City High when Brad Smith was there. That was my first assignment. That's how I got into wrestling, covering wrestling, was covering his state championship team in 1999. They won it without a state champion, which is almost unheard of now in the era of the super teams. They had one finalist, uh, won it on the backside. I think it came down to the last match of the tournament. One of the Fulsis brothers uh, who went on uh, to wrestle for the Hawkeyes, They had to, one of the Fulsis twins had to get... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, had to get a, a tech or a, or a pin for Decora to win and couldn't quite get it done. And so Iowa City High won by, I think, half a point. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Brad was great to deal with in that early years, and that's probably one, probably uh, thanks to him. Uh, it's part of the reason why I, I am where I am. I had such a good experience wow. covering his team back then, and he made uh, my job so easy back then. So hats off to Brad. Thanks so much. I'm grateful for uh, all the things that he's done for my career. Not only that, he coached four four-time state champions. Wow. Let's go through that. Jeff McGinnis, Carter Happel, Morningstar, and, and Light. Light. Yep, you got it. So he coached four Iowa high school state wrestling champions. There's been 25, so he has an influence on a lot of those. And getting a chance to talk to him, it's, it's neat that he is getting the Bob Siddons, Iowa High School Wrestling Coach of the Year, later this evening. So that's neat that you have that connection. 23 state championships between those two. That's a great achievement. Yeah, absolutely. Now, tell us a little bit about, uh, before I sidetrack you here, um, tell us a little bit about Hall of Fame weekend, what's going on uh, this weekend here in the Cedar Valley. Who's in the Hall of Fame class? Uh, Fill the audience in on that a little bit. Great class. We have Kevin Dresser, who's going to be coming up later tonight. Chris Bono is out golfing. Tony Davis, the most recent NCAA wrestling champion for the University of Northern Iowa, is going in, along with John Bowlesby, a guy that a lot of people may not know much about. But he made a senior world team directly out of high school at 220 pounds. So if that gives you any indi- indication of how good he was, that wow. uh, that should show you how uh, what kind of level he was straight out of high school. Bannocks are getting a, a family legacy award, and then, Teske and Thompson, Brody Teske and Alex Thompson getting the Bob Steenlidge Iowa High School Wrestler of the Year. Really couldn't go one way or the other, so we had to make that decision that they were both going to get it. So that's a, a great class that we have. Bob Rothler was at Emmitsburg for all those years. He's also getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. So it's all great to have these guys here. Excited about that and excited to get Brad Smith on the line with us here now. 
Our first guest and state champion for the University of Iowa in 1975. Six. 76. I got it wrong. I'm glad you, you corrected me. You should know that. And most importantly, you set the all-time record in Iowa for 12th traditional state wrestling championship as a team. Just broke Bob Siddons' record. Congratulations on that. You coach four four-time state wrestling champions. You have a great piece of history. When you think about that in the scope of things, after all your coaching career, four four-time state champions, 12 traditional state team championships, put that in perspective for us. Well, you know, it's a great feeling to be in the same name with um, Bob Siddons. You know, he's a he's a legend, and, uh, and uh, I've worked camps with him when he was, you know, back in the day and stuff and learned a lot from him. But... Um, yeah, it's a great feeling to, to reach that that goal as, as a coach because you always have goals and and you're always shooting for something. And um, I've had a lot of help over the years, so I've got some outstanding uh, guys on my staff at uh, Lisbon right now. And it's not just me, so we've just got a good a good base, a good foundation, and and things have gone well lately for us. You have Jeff McGinnis out here as one of the celebrities. He was one of your four-time state wrestling champions. Undefeated four-time state wrestling champion. Went on to be a two-time NCAA wrestling champion for the University of Iowa. What separated him? How did he get so good? Well, he was already good before I got there. I, I came his junior year, and his junior and senior year, he, he, was, he was untouchable. Very, very good technically and uh, never got out of position. Always in great shape, and he was like a cat, always landing on his feet. He's just an exceptional. He's probably one of the best, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to coach. Most recent was Carter Happel. He's at the University of Iowa right now. What uh, what kind of trend do you see with the entire Happel family? That's a, a big family, and that's going to be a big name in the sport. Is that an influence of the family that they have that uh, they got so good in wrestling? Yeah, I just uh, they're just following the brothers' footsteps. Like you know, Carter was a four timer, obviously, and he's at Iowa right now. And then we got another one right behind him now, Kel Happel. And you know, pound for pound, he's he's one of the toughest kids in the state of Iowa. And he'll be going for his third title next year. And you know, I can't see anybody beating him. But you know, he's got to keep working and, and go from there. And then we got Quincy coming up this year as a freshman. And Dean, the dad, and the mom have they're they're great wrestling people. And um, they take him everywhere, and, and you know, and to find out the best competition, and they've got where they are because of that. You're from Illinois. You came to the University of Iowa. What brought you here? I think you might have been on the the beginning end with uh, Gary Kirtlemeyer, and then Gable took over. What was it about Iowa that brought you from from your home state to this state? Well, I, I wrestled junior nationals in Iowa City when I was in high school, my junior and senior year, and uh, met um, met uh, Gable, met Kurt Meyer, and uh, I knew that was Gable's first year as a, as a freshman with me coming in, and we got some real good recruits that year with Tim Zazeski and Chuck Gagel and some of those guys. So having Gable be in there and, and Kurt Meyer was the major influence why I went to Iowa. Brad, what are the uh, biggest differences that you've noticed in high school wrestling now versus when you first got in? I th- I just think uh, there there's a lot more better clubs now. Club wrestling guys have more opportunity to to excel in the sport, um, and the good ones put put the time in. You know, with Fargo and you know the freestyle and the Greco and. Um, just the club wrestling. There's a lot of good club coaches out there that aren't, aren't even high school wrestlers or coaches that do an outstanding job. Like we got several kids over in Eastern Iowa like from Lisbon, and you got Terry Brands over there, and, and Mike, you know, Matt McDonald was there, and this James Kelly. I mean, they just there's just so many so many good clubs now, and it gives the kids opportunity to learn from better better coaches. We'll end with this. You are mentioned prominently in Dan Gable's book, his second book, about the 10-mile runs that he put you through and that you had put out on a form that you didn't need motivation, that you didn't need that extra push, and he put you through these 10-mile runs. You won the NCAA championships your senior year because of those runs, according to the chapter. Take us through what that all did for you. Well, you know, I was at a point in my career, you know, I thought I, I could have been, you know, two or three time All-American and I come my senior year and, and I haven't placed, you know, in the top six. And um, so I needed something and, and Gable, you know, how he is, he he's the type of coach to figure out what in each individual needs. 
and uh, he figured out I just need a little bit more mental toughness. And those 10 mile runs gave me a little bit more mental toughness, I think. And uh, I didn't realize he did it as many times as I did, but supposing his book, he said I did it like six times. So um, it got me, you know, over the hump. And, you know, I never ran more than two or three miles at a time. So when I did those 10 mile runs, it really helped my confidence. Brad, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being part of the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament. Andy, we're going to bring in Mac Ryder in a couple minutes here. Mac Ryder, three-time All-American for Minnesota, four-time state wrestling champion. He's here as a celebrity at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament. But we need to take a couple minutes to talk about Final X. Experimental stage right now for this new format. It is caused a lot of talk, a lot of conversation. But we get a chance to go to Lincoln, Nebraska, and watch What's probably the most compelling of the three final X's, you have world champions. You have Kyle Snyder there going against Kyvan Gadsden. You have IMR going against Jordan Burroughs. You have James Green going against Jason Chamberlain. And then I think probably the one that everyone's curious about is Thomas Gilman going against the young star in Dayton Fix. And then the women's slate. It's going to be a lot of fun going there and seeing what this format's like after all of the conversation i don't want to say controversy because i don't think it's necessarily that i just think it sparked a lot of dialogue about what the correct format should be absolutely and you look at the us as a wrestling community we can't ever 100 percent agree on anything can we we can't and so I, you knew that like yeah. like this would be debated something yeah. that's this big that changes things this much and it will be interesting two and a half weeks from now what the reception is when this thing's all over I think that's right, and I think we want to give it a chance. I think we want yeah. to see what the format is, and I'm excited about what the, the potential could be. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be able to work when it comes to be an Olympic trials year, an Olympic year when they have the Olympic trials. I think with timing, this probably worked because the World Championships are later in the year. I don't know the exact dates, but I think they're in October this year. Yep. So I, I think that it's going to be an interesting format and in how this all plays out, but I think a lot of the matches are going to be pretty locked. I think a, a guy like Jordan Burroughs, as good as Imar is and his potential, I just see Jordan Burroughs at a different plane right now. I just don't even see, see that being competitive. I see a couple tech falls there. But you're still going to have a couple competitive matches along the way. Hey, Kyvin Gadsden has shown that he can beat Kyle Snyder. He pinned him in the 2015 NCAA Championship Finals. Last time they wrestled, it was a couple tech falls. We're going to see if he can close the gap on that. Kyvin Gadsden's living in names right now. It's it's close to home for him. So we'll see what he can do against Kyle Snyder, the the star of our country right now in wrestling. Yeah, I was thinking about it. Uh, Kyvin Gadsden was out, out here last year playing golf. Yeah, the Gable. And there's a reason golf he's not here him, today because right? <laughs> tomorrow is final X. For I him. remember talking to him out in the parking lot a year ago at this thing and saying, uh, you know, he's got a big task ahead of him. I remember he, him talking about uh, got to get ready for Kyle. What are your thoughts on Final X? What do you What do you think? Do you think uh, Do you like it? Do you think uh, it's something that's going to stick? I mean, you mentioned 2020 and and the obstacles that are in place there when the Olympics are in late July. But uh, what are your thoughts on it? I think what I don't like or what concerns me is that the Rochester World Team Trials. You don't put all of these guys who are competing in that on a pedestal. You're just putting the guys that make the finals on a pedestal. So it seemed like you just took a step backwards at that World Team Trials event in Rochester. They're warming up on the sideline. It felt like a high school atmosphere. They didn't have the staging area. It just felt like a regression a little bit as far as how we're building up these stars. We're building up two stars in each weight class unbelievably. We're putting those guys on this huge pedestal. But I think that these guys on the three, four, five, six, they're still NBA caliber. If you want to make comparisons, they're still the all pros. They're the, the elite of the elite. You want those guys to get the credit and the recognition. I know from my vantage point, Andy, and explaining this to at least 20 people, nobody gets it right away unless you followed it. I mean, we follow this every single day. It is next to impossible to explain the format where Really, there's five different events to make this decision on who gets on the world team. You have U.S. Open, you have the world team trials in Rochester, and then you have the three final X's. And then you have to try to explain, no, they're not all at one. There, There's different weight classes at each one. And like Bill Zadig says, it, it provides that challenge that the, the peaking and the training cycle, yeah. you, you just have two weeks difference, and that is more difficult, even though you have the regional training centers. I think that's the 
that's going to be the difficult part. But I still want to give it a chance. I think yeah. this can be a, a really elite event. I think it's a unique concept. I just hope people come out and support it and give it a shot. Well, we've talked before on this podcast about the struggle with drawing big crowds to international style wrestling in the United States. Why can't we, you know, why is it that the World Cup draws less than half as much as the Iowa State High School finals? And, you know, the World Cup in Iowa City, which was really well attended for past, compared to past World Cups. But that's, you know, there's just been that disconnect. The U.S. Open has never drawn a ton of people out there. I, th- I, I think years watching it being live streamed in there or, or even talking to people that were out there and people saying, yeah, there's 800, a thousand people in the stands. And these are the superstars in our sport in the United States. They go from competing in front of crowds of 20,000 at the NCAA championships down to, you know, one tenth of that at, uh, at the open or, uh, you know, a, a fifth of that at the world team trials. So, yeah, I hope that, that uh, this showcases international style wrestling for people that normally wouldn't get out and watch it. The people in, in State College in Bethlehem that might not have given it a shot before, or might not have uh, gone across the country to watch it, that they get out and they support uh, the world, you know, the guys that are competing, guys and girls that are competing for the world team. So that, that will be the key. I, you know, talking to some people that uh, are, are the diehards, I, I've heard some Several people say, well, I would go if it was all in one spot, but it's mm-hmm. not. You know, I would go to Bethlehem if it was all there or State College if it was all there or Lincoln if it was all there. But, you know, you're splitting it in thirds now. Uh, so I'm, I'm open minded. I, I hope that uh, I hope that it's a huge success. I don't know that uh, necessarily will be, but uh, this was a, a, a massive swing at it. Right. I mean, it wasn't yeah. a wasn't like uh, we're going to kind of try this. We're going to dip our toe in the water and see what uh, happens here. It's three sites rather than, you know, just expanding it to say two or uh, I, I like the fact that uh, you're putting them all on a level playing field, so to speak now where, you know, it's not somebody wrestling four or five matches in one day, getting ready and then wrestling uh, somebody else that's been sitting. We'll see. We'll see uh, how, how this, uh, you know, last year there were two guys that went through the challenge tournament that won, Thomas Gilman and Zane Rutherford. How many of them can can pull that off this, this go-around? How many people can go through uh, Rochester and, and wind up making the team? And to your point with the U23 World Team Trials, here's a, a great event with guys competing post-collegiately. You had Colin Moore in the finals, Tech Fall, Kyle Connell twice. Kyle Connell beat Colin Moore at the NCAA Championships twice. That really wasn't vindication. That doesn't stop the storyline for next year if those guys ever wrestle again. And so with people that are watching it from the outside, those NCAA Championship fans, they probably don't know that Kyle Connell got tech fault twice and got handled by Colin Moore at the U23 World Team Trials. That storyline's still going to carry on for ESPN next year. It's still going to be the same that, hey, he beat him twice in college and that it was a big upset at the NCAA championships. People will remember that. I just don't know that once that college season is over, a lot of these people, if they're fans of Ohio state or you and I, or whatever college program, they kind of check out a little bit. And so your crowd diminishes a little bit and they don't follow the, the individuals as much. We are driven by teams and the international style of wrestling is an individual type of mentality until it comes to the world championships. Then it's team USA. Yeah, and I think the the lack of a defined freestyle Greco season absolutely hurts a little bit too, and, th- and, th- yeah. and that's part of uh, why Final X was formed. Now it's it's more of a defined season. Um, you know, if it doesn't stick, then we I think we lose that a little bit. But uh, it's such you know, and we've talked about this too. It's such a good product right now. Why, there has to be a greater following that, you know, the people that are not following it are missing out right now. Do you think we can get to RTC versus RTCs where they compete against each other in a team format? I hope so. I hope so. I think that's what's missing a little bit. Yeah. You know, to your point, and David Mercatani says this all the time, the phrase that he uses on uh, weighing in when we talk about stuff like this, people root for the laundry. You know, they root for, you know, the, the Hawkeyes in the black and gold singlet, the Cowboys wearing orange and black, Penn State with the navy blue singlets of the white belts around them. 
you know, that goes a long way. I think the college allegiance goes a long, long way. And, and there are people that will, you know, the Penn State fans are always going to root for David Taylor. You know, the Iowa fans are always going to root for Thomas Gilman, so on and so forth. But uh, it's not quite the same following. That's a great point because once a transfer goes to another school, they're now part of that school. They're, they're no longer that individual. We like franchises, especially with you. You're a huge Yankees fan. You yeah. like the Yankees. It's not necessarily the individual. If Aaron Judge went somewhere else, do you think you'd like him as much? Not as much. I mean, I I don't know. It depends on what kind of circumstances he left yeah. the Yankees under. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it... Uh, you like the franchise. Yeah, here's the thing. Like, David Cohn was my favorite pitcher on the Yankees championship run that era. Uh, when he went and he pitched for the Red Sox, I liked seeing him give up home runs. <laughs> well, <in> my <laughs> point, exactly. You're, you're a fan of the franchise. Let's bring in Mac Ryder here, four-time state wrestling champion at Gilbertville Don Bosco. You share a piece of history with your brother. You are the only brothers to win four-time state wrestling championships, three-time All-American at the University of Minnesota. And everyone wants to know, how did you get to Minnesota after being in Iowa? Oh, man. You asked for five minutes. That's a lot longer story than five minutes. Um, long story short, I, I mean, I just kind of, a little bit of me was worried. You know, I used to go down when I lived, in, when I was in high school, I would go down and I would stay with Mark Ryland, uh, you know, former Iowa wrestler. He would let me stay at his place and he would help train me all summer long. And it was just, he was such a, um, a help to my career. But when it came time to make my decision, a little part of me was kind of worried that if, you know, if I went to Iowa, I may kind of end up doing something that I've, you know, the same thing I've done my whole life um, a little bit. And I kind of wanted to challenge myself, I guess, so to speak. So that was part of it. Um, another part of it, to be completely honest, I flipped a coin. Um, I was down in my room by myself. And I think, you know, I, I took a quarter down and I flipped it and in the air, I knew in my heart I wanted to come up Minnesota, um, and it did. And I called Jay and said I'm coming to Minnesota. That right as soon as it uh, came up heads, and I, I don't know. I just I, there was a lot more stuff that went into it, but um, that was most of it. There was just kind of I wanted to do something a little different, I guess. When I think of Mac Ryder, the first thing I think about is I think about Doug Ryder, who passed away uh, a couple years ago from cancer, but. I saw a guy that had just unbelievable drive, unbelievable determination, encapsulate his legacy and what he meant to you. Uh, I mean, that's, again, you know, we don't have five minutes. Really, um, he's he, everything I think that, um, you know, I'm a small portion of what he was as, as far as, you know, I, if I had had the, the drive and the tenacity and just the, the stubbornness that he had, um, I probably would have gone a lot further in the sport, but, um, you know, I just, everything he did in his life, he always, you know, he, there's so many things I think about just, um, there was a time when he asked me to help build this or to build this fence. He had to go to work and I had to build this fence for, um, to keep the cows in. And I went out and, you know, I, I didn't probably do the best job and he came home and he looked at it and he's like, that's, that's terrible. You're going to do it again tomorrow. Um, you know, you, if you're going to do a job, you're going to do it right. You're going to do it perfect. And it was just kind of everything that everything he did in his life, he wanted to do perfect. He wanted to do, do it the right way. Cause if, you know, if you're going to do it, might as well do it right. And, um, that, I mean, that encompassed everything from his faith to his, his marriage to my mom, to the way he raised us kids to, you know, the way he kind of tried to help build the Gilberville community. You wrestled for Jay Robinson, and he also coached at the University of Iowa. He was an assistant coach under Dan Gable. I may have asked you this, but I always ask the Minnesota wrestlers. Jay tries to downplay it that he didn't like, or he didn't dislike Iowa. He always said, ah, you know, Iowa's just another team. From everything I've seen, Jay hated Iowa. What did he say to you guys about Iowa when you, you were an athlete? I don't know so that much that he hated it. He just, like, really respected it in a way that, like, he could he could act like it's just another team, but it never was. Like he coached entirely different the week leading up to the Iowa duel. He coached entirely different going into Big Tens because he like Iowa was going to be there. And he I I don't know maybe I'm reading him wrong, but he always kind of felt like me that he wanted to prove to Iowa that you know he was a, a great coach. You know that that when he left, you know obviously they you know he coached under 
Dan there for a couple years at Iowa and then went up to Minnesota. And, um, but I think he always kind of wanted to prove that he was just as good of a coach or so to speak. I mean, he, he, as much as he wants to say it was just another team on the other side, it, it never was. He, he made it more than, than what it, anybody else did, I would say. Yeah, and it, it was interesting because I think at one point Jay said if he hadn't left Iowa, he would have loved to have just stayed as an assistant under Dan Gable. So that kind of blew me away that he had that thought and that uh, that determination. Jay Robinson, a unique guy. How did he raise the level of our sport? Oh, I mean, he's everything. And I, I mean, he took Minnesota from from there was no real programming while he was there, but like there was there wasn't really a program there. there and he built and it took a lot of years and it took a lot of effort and it took a lot of mistakes and, and you know he kind of refined his his coaching style over the years but um more so than just minnesota i mean the, the guy lives wrestling every single day that he's alive i mean every everything he does entire life revolves around wrestling and how to how to make the sport better how to promote it better how to market it better how to get more people involved like it's just you know it's a tireless effort that he, he constantly lives every day to try to even even still you know like I mean, we talked about he's still you know he's getting a little slower moving around now but it, it hasn't changed the way he's tried to to keep building the sport of wrestling got a couple questions for you mac first of all what's your consummate jay story oh man um let's see what's my best jay story Jay, if you know Jay, Jay always tries to argue with you no matter what, okay? <laughs> Everything, no matter what, if, if he asks you a question and you give the exact word-for-word word answer that he was looking for, he's going to tell you, no, that was wrong, and he's going to change his stance on it. So one time, my senior year, we were down at Oklahoma State. We wrestled Iowa on Friday, we wrestled Oklahoma State on Saturday, and I had a tough weekend. I lost to Slayton on Friday and uh, Coleman Scott on Saturday, or Sunday, and we went to, we just stopped to eat somewhere at the uh, at a restaurant before we went to the airport to fly home and you know i was kind of down or whatever i was still you know upset with myself senior year wasn't going the way i'd I'd planned and it's just small talk was getting made and some somebody asked like what's your favorite dessert and i kind of thought for a bit i was like i like rub your floats and jay was like no what do you mean no he's like that doesn't count rub your floats not a dessert i was like why why would it not be it's ice cream and he's and so we got this argument we were like trying to debate whether it was and he said you know what you find me any menu you ever find me a menu that shows a root beer float under desserts and i can't remember what he told me he would do and so for the last like 10 years i've sent him countless pictures where every time i find it i'm like look i told you it was a dessert you know it's just it's just kind of the way he was he he wanted every every moment was a teaching moment and if he agreed with you well then he didn't teach you anything so he always tried to try to cha- you know kind of argue everything or make it a debate. Interesting times for the Gophers right now. I mean, mm-hmm. we're so accustomed to seeing Minnesota in trophy yep. contention. A step back last year, but uh, new facility on the way, mm-hmm. uh, top notch recruiting class on the way. What's the vibe surrounding Minnesota wrestling right now? I would say it's it's kind of I mean it's optimistic. You know, everybody wants to believe that you know with Gable coming in, um, some of these you know some of the other guys, and I think you know with everybody moving up in weights next year. Maybe it's healthier. You know, obviously Mitch McKee, you know, he's a great freestyle wrestler, but his U23 performance, I mean, he beat Cade Brock, and, yeah, he, he gutted him three times, but he took him down twice too. Um, there's hope that that we can get back where we should be. And, you know, the last four, three, four years, five years have been pretty hard. Um, you know, I'm not it, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It sucked, and, and it's, been, it's been tough. But um, I think everybody as a whole is, is pretty optimistic that, the right people are in place to get the job done, and we got the some some extremely exciting guys coming in, uh, and you know I think we hope to be back. Gilbertville, Iowa, is the Odessa, Texas. It's the Friday Night Lights. I mean, you are the quintessential wrestling town in the United States. When you come back to Gilbertville, Iowa, what kind of re- response do you get from the community? Oh, it's nothing but support. I mean, this place is amazing. I, I mean, I. You know, I live in Minneapolis, and I've stayed there since I graduated. But if I ever leave Minneapolis, there's only one place I'd ever go, and it's coming back to Gilderville. I mean, it, it's uh, it's home to me, and it's, you know, from an outside perspective, from a 10,000-foot point of view, it'd probably be a, a very weird place. Um, but the people there and the community there has just uh, raised me. It made me who I am, and, then I'll, you know, we, we grew up on a little farm two and a half miles east of town, and that place is... 
is uh, holds a special place in my heart, I guess I'd say. I'm going to let you get your sandwich. You All need right. to get back out on the course. Thanks for joining us. That was Mac Ryder, four-time state wrestling champion from Gilbertville, Don Bosco, three-time All-American for Minnesota. We'll be back with more. Our next guest is the pride of Davidson, Michigan. His name is Brent Metcalf, two-time NCAA wrestling champion, three-time finalist for the University of Iowa. Now he's an assistant wrestling coach at Iowa State University. You getting used to that, to being a Cyclone? Uh, yeah, I have. It's It's been a really good transition. The support has been amazing from, uh, obviously, the wrestling community, but also just the administration. And uh, we've got all the tools we need. Team is starting to make growth, and uh, we're getting the ball rolling. What's the difference in mentality between the programs? Everyone talks about how you guys are all Hawkeyes, but what are you trying to do different than what the University of Iowa might do? Um, I think just implement our style of, I wouldn't say a similar philosophy, but our style of that, right? So um, you use the, you hear the common words of domination and spreading the gap, you know, and, and um, not winning tight matches, that sort of philosophy. Um, but kind of the way that we do it, which is was probably different than what's going on over there, I would suppose. Um, so from coaching style, I think a lot of that's led by Mike Zadick. Um, he's probably a little bit more of a laid back style. Um, he's to compliment him, and something I've really learned is just um, being very adaptable to the different individuals that you have, um, and just you know, there's guys with so many different areas of strengths. And just being able to use what they've got and build off of that. And um, I think so far we've done a pretty good job with what we have of just, you know, making the, the best wrestler out of that guy, that individual, and, and, and with his strengths. You lost a couple guys to transfer. You lost Marcus Harrington, a guy that just said he didn't want to wrestle anymore. Did you know going in that that might happen, that guys might want to not necessarily adopt your philosophy and go elsewhere? I think that that would be expected. Uh, when you've got a program that is, what I think it was 65th in the country or something, it was at the bottom, um, that you would expect that there would be some turnover, there would be some guys that weren't going to fit. Um, you know, each one of those cases was all different in its own way, but just in general, to generalize it all, um, you know, you come in with a new philosophy, you come in with a, maybe a new lifestyle for these guys, maybe new expectations, and to varying degrees, I think a number of them just decided that um, they weren't maybe on that same course. So some of them wanted to quit and be done with wrestling completely. That was a lot of the guys. Um, and some of them just wanted maybe a, a different coach or different style, which is completely fine. We wish all those guys the best. Um, so really that's what it was really all about was kind of saying, hey, guys, this is the new level that we're going to be at, and it's at the highest level. And this is what it's going to take to get us there. So if you want to do these things or you want to – file in line you know this is the path let's let's all jump on it together and a number of guys just i don't think we're we're willing to do that so that's kind of where you get that turnover and, and that's good it's good for the program that room is a much different room now than it was a year ago um it's an exciting room it's a room with a, a, a lot of flurries and a lot of points being scored um just the energy's higher because everyone's on the same page and everyone's working toward the same goal you're used to winning. You're used to dominating. That's how you competed. That's what you were when you were coaching at the University of Iowa and part of that program on international teams. What was it like to maybe take 10, 20 steps back and just know that this is all a rebuilding phase? Um, it's definitely been different for me. Um, I would say that Coach Dresser obviously has been through it a number of different times. Um, probably, I think Derek had some experience when he was at North Dakota State with just lower level Team. So that was that was an adjustment for me for sure. Um, not that the expectation lowers for, that you have for the guys, but just kind of changing maybe the way you coach guys and the way you work with guys because it's gonna you're gonna have to build a guy up. You can't take them from let's say five and say hey you need to be at 100 tomorrow. You know, so there's there's got to be some slower growth there, and uh, so it's been really good for me to just kind of learn and have to maybe adapt. Um, my coaching style or, or the way that, that I think that wrestlers can build and grow in the sport. So it's been maybe a growing year for me individually. One of your guys, Austin Gomez, heading off to Slovakia in September, Junior World Championships. Mm -hmm. What has impressed you in the year that you've spent around him? Uh, that's a big deal. It's a big deal for him. It's a big deal for our program that he made that world team. Um, really for him it was expected because it was kind of payback after last year and he kind of got cut short there. Um, but he has been just an awesome leader um, to our team, obviously to us and, and, and the change that's going on. He's a great example. He is someone that every day in the room 
whether it's 6 a.m. when no one's in there or it, when it's 3.30 when the whole team's together that you could point to and you can say, hey, this guy's doing the right stuff. He's doing it the right way. As far as his training, as far as the way he competes, um, just his mentality, you know, put aside his style of wrestling, right? But just the, the, how important the sport of wrestling is to him and how important uh, being successful is, um, it, it's something that has started to bleed into our program and just hope that you continue to – that he will, and then you continue to add some of these uh, younger guys that that we're br- that we're bringing in that are going to be of the same mentality, and and hopefully that ball just keeps rolling and, and it's going good. Brent, thanks for coming on the program on the mat. We enjoyed that. Thanks for being at the Dan Gubel Celebrity Golf Tournament, and we hope we will get you back here and in your out. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Andy, our next guest, we debated on whether we should have him on the show. We weren't sure that being a three-time NCAA champion, four-time finalist, Olympic gold medalist was good enough to be on this show, but we went ahead with it anyway. His name's Ed Bannock. He wrestled at the University of Iowa under Dan Gable and then went on to, as we said, win the 1984 Olympics, also known for some of the world's worst jokes or really good jokes, however you want to do it. Just give us maybe a couple of your diamonds in the rough. All right, do you know how to throw a party in outer space? You plan it. Okay. Okay, that's one. Next one is, okay, in the Jamaican Islands, if you buy a slice of pie, apple pie, it's $2.50. But if you go to the Bahama Islands, it's $3. You know what you call that? The Pirates of the Caribbean. You got a couple right there. Our On the Mat listeners are going to be very excited about those jokes. Now, no joking because it's truly something that Randy Lewis takes pride in. Are you better than Randy Lewis as a University of Iowa Hawkeye? <laughs> how am I supposed to answer that? Honestly? <laughs> <laughs> well, how are you going to determine better? It, you know, is it by record? Is it by tournaments won? So on. all I can say is, is uh, when I was a high school senior, I looked up to Randy Lewis and I saw him wrestling while in high school in like the Omaha Open and uh, winning and, and doing some incredible things. And so it was... I look forward to when I made the commitment to Iowa to be a, a teammate of Randy Lewis, uh, Bruce Kinseth, and, and Mark Trezino, and Scott Trezino, and all those guys. It was fun. It was it was really looking forward to, to wonderful times. You are getting the Family Legacy Award at the Glen Brand Wrestling Hall of Fame of Iowa. Of course, we're here at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament. Family is very important to you. That's why you wrote a book. Tell us about the book you're writing and how we can order the book. The book is called Uncommon Bonds. Um, my brothers Lou and Steve and I were talking about, you know, how you don't know until you lived your life if it was normal or not. I don't think everybody, anybody has a normal life, but we got to thinking back, well, we really didn't have a normal life. We were adopted early on because of a fire in our home where we come from a family of 14 biological uh, siblings. And so <clears throat> we had a rocky start. My mom was German. My dad was Polish. And uh, they went through World War II, and there's a whole story in, in the book talk, talks about that. But then as we look back, we, we each of us said the same thing. We saw how so many people went out of the way to help us. Now it's our turn to help them, and that's one of the reasons why we wrote the book, to be inspirational. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, bannockpower3.com, and you can order the book there. We're selling them here today at the uh, golf tournament. So it's... It's not just about wrestling. My brother Steve's a retired military uh, officer, uh, Fulberg Colonel, and uh, he does a lot of leadership training uh, with uh, the military today. And so it's it's um, the book is funny. There are stories that we tell. Uh, three boys growing up, you know, one brother thirteen months older than the other two was the leader, and. Uh, it was fun to see Steve not only led us, he led the, the military uh, soldiers that served under him. And it's kind of fun to, once we get it out there, say, well, is it any good? People are buying it, so it must be okay. So we're, we're pretty pleased. You were in the upstart era where the University of Iowa was dominating. 1980 through 1983 were your years. You won three NCAA championships and four national team championships. Is that a lot of fun going through that time, that a special time where you're in the finals every year, you win national tournaments? That had to be a blast for you to do that. It was fun, but it was. It, it's a situation where this is the first time you experienced it, so you didn't know what you could compare it against. Uh, I did win a couple high school state tournaments. Uh, I won my senior year in wrestling. My junior year I took second, but the team won. So I was used to winning, and so, well, yeah, that's what you do. You, you go, you get a great coach, you get a great team, you, you win. And so that was my um, expectation when I went to Iowa and when I was able to accomplish that. Then 
as I got older and, and the years started to roll by, I started looking back at that. It's like, oh, that was pretty special, come to think of it. You've taken a different career path. You were at Iowa State and the academic side, and now you're taking that to help high school students. Fill us in on what you're doing right now, Ed. Well, as you said, I was assistant wrestling coach at Iowa State, and then I was in student-athlete services for 16 years, and then I just uh, retired February 1st, semi-retired February 1st from uh, athletics compliance. There's a niche out there. A lot of high school kids don't understand the NCAA Division One or Division Two requirements to be athletically eligible to compete, practice, and receive aid their first year of college. And so what I'm going to do is go through the high school coaches and, and educate them on how I can my consulting services can help them and help their student athletes make sure after 10th grade, after 11th grade, after 12th grade, they're on track. And then after 12th grade, when they graduate, they're eligible to compete, practice and receive aid their first year of college. Dave and Mark Schultz, two guys that you were on the Olympic team with, you competed against Mark Schultz. Tell us what they were like, what it was like being around those guys during the Olympic camp. Well, it, yeah, Dave and Mark are, are, are unique to say the least. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sad to hear, you know, I was sad to hear Dave's passing and uh, Mark, Mark was an incredibly athletically talented and gifted person. Uh, his balance is, is power. I mean, it was, it was, it was a challenge to wrestle him and uh, we wrestled six times. I beat him the first four times. He beat me the last two and put the people remember the last two times. Uh, and then Dave, I actually wrestled him um, when I was a freshman in, uh, at Iowa during the summer, I was trying out for the junior world team, or I can't remember, it was the 20 and under, and Dave was 20 at the time, and I was 19, and uh, I remember wrestling him, and he beat me the two out of two, and, and so I what, didn't make the team. There was some shenanigans there, I won't go into details, but but there was, there. I respected him as wrestlers, and uh, heck, I was a 198 pounder in the Olympics, and Dave wanted to wrestle me, he's a 63 pounder, and uh, we scrapped that, it was fun. Ed, I'm going to put you in a time machine here. Head Panic Olympic champion versus Kyle Snyder Olympic champion. What does that match look like? What would be your approach to that match? I defer to let Louis Russell. <laughs> I was a 98 pounder. Snyder's at 214, so he's more he's closer to 220 than he is to 198. So I'd let Louis Russell. <laughs> How about Jaden Cox? We'll go down to Jaden Cox. He's 189, 202 right now. Well, I did wrestle Chris Campbell, and, and uh, Chris and Jaden are very similar. And uh, I was able to beat Chris that one time, and he beat me two times. And uh, I was the 80 uh, Olympic trials in in Brockport, New York. Jay, I mean, I'm a Jay Robinson disciple. That's who taught me the A, the B, and the C of wrestling. I'm a Dan Gable disciple when it comes to, you got to put, Mark Mesnick said this quote, most men quit when they begin to tire. Good men go until they think they're going to collapse. But the very best know the mind tires before the body. Therefore, they push themselves further and further beyond all limits. Only when these limits are shattered can the unattainable be reached. Dr. Mark Mesnick wrote that. He was an alternate on the 76 Olympic Greco team. And he was a roommate of mine for two years back in college. The thing about that was Gable understood that. And the three years that I won, I knew I was going to win nationals. The year that I lost, I didn't know I was going to win nationals because I didn't develop that type of mindset that I had developed the first two years and then the, the fourth year. So <clears throat> Gable, the, the, the mesh of the coaching styles, Gable, Robinson, Yagla, and then Mark Johnson fit Iowa back then. And, you know, I think when when – Robinson left, there was a void, and Dan suffered a little bit for that. And then he got Jimmy Zaleski in there, and then when Jimmy left, there was a void again. So the, the sport of wrestling now is also due to the regional training centers ballooned where back when I wrestled, maybe four or five teams legitimately could win the NCAA championship. When you have the top 30 wrestlers in a weight class, the top 10 would, would be, you know, the, the 10th ranked guy could upset the number one ranked guy, but not the 30th ranked guy. Now you go to the NCAA tournament, the 30th ranked guy is upsetting the number one guy. I mean, that didn't happen back in my day. But it's interesting to watch the sport of wrestling grow and expand, and, and more programs are pursuing the regional training centers so they can have steel sharp and steel so one man sharp is another, the Bible verse. Well, think about it. If high school or college football players were playing or practicing against pro football players on a regular basis, how good would those college football players be? A lot better than the college players are playing on every Saturday. So that's what the regional training center does is it brings the 
competition level brings the uh, wrestling skill level up to world class as opposed to just college class level. Ed Bannock, the horse. Thanks for being on the show with us. Thanks for being at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament. And congratulations on the Bannock family receiving the Family Legacy Award. We've appreciated this time. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate it. Thank you. Andy, the stars keep coming. We have Jay Hilgenberg, five-time All-Pro, seven-time Pro Bowl, part of that legendary 1985 Bears team. But when you got introduced and you had a little chat, you talked about placing second at the state wrestling tournament you almost felt like hey i'm not even worthy to be here given all your credentials tell us about your wrestling background because it was fascinating you said you would not be the player you were had it been not not been for the sport of wrestling uh, there's there's no question i i uh wouldn't have been the football player or, or had near the career I, I i had in the nfl if it wasn't for wrestling um i mean it just uh, Mike Dicka always had a say. Always had a saying to us when we were playing. It's not what you achieve in life; it's what you overcome. And when, when I started my wrestling career in a middle school, Southeast Junior High in Iowa City, um, I, I was a terrible wrestler. I was a, a short, uh, fat little kid, and uh, no confidence. Got nervous before matches, and, and I, I barely won any matches. I remember uh, one match in middle school where I got a forfeit, and the, the team was celebrating that I was getting a forfeit before the match, and I was counting it as a victory. So that was that was my one win that year. But then it, it, as I grew and and um, and got stronger and in the wrestling, I got really good coaching from Clyde Bean from City High School. Uh, what what wrestling does is is it gives you the confidence that that in any situation you're in that that you can handle it. It, it, it te- teaches you self discipline. It's just there's just so many great lessons from uh, wrestling. And I'm, I'm not even talking what it did for me in football as allows at to inside uh, hand control, being an offensive lineman, to get inside position, while uh, playing with leverage. Uh, Knowing where your body is at, it's just it just ties into so much to, to football that, I mean, I, I really believe wrestling should just be a staple that every kid. I mean, it should be a, a like a, it should be like math in in, in uh, school. I, I just think it's the self confidence that teaches uh, kids uh, across the every phase of life. It's just so beneficial. You got to be a part of it. A lot of people are fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by it, that 1985 Bears team that you were part of. You were the starting center there. There was a magic to that. There was just some chemistry there. Tell us what that chemistry was, how it formulated, and how you guys got so good with that 15-1 and season. It's it's really um it's it's confidence. Uh, we we had a really bad preseason. I think uh, I don't know if we we may have won our our last preseason game, but. We our first few preseason games are really bad, uh, but we just we had a good year the year before, and uh, it's just we worked so hard at what we did preparing for that '85 season because the '84 season we got to the NF- NFC Championship game and got beat 23 zip by the 49ers, and you know it's just a frustration of getting so close to the Super Bowl and get beat 23 zip. Thinking that, oh man, how are we ever going to get back here? But I, literally, I mean, everybody. I mean, it's what Mike Dicka said. You know, you put that chip on your shoulder, and uh, we did. And um, we really came together as a team. That's what it takes. You know, as you come to if you can come together as a unit and make that your prime goal. That is your goal to do it. And we we did it that year. Unfortunately, we could never get back to it. But um, the '85 year was definitely just a magical year, and it's. Um, it's something that's you know you look back you look back at it so for so many years I looked at the '85 season and all I could was upset about the Dolphins' loss. Now you know I don't even care about that anymore. I'm just you know it, it, it was a great year. You seem to be really checked into the sport of wrestling. You know about Final X and wanting to go to Lincoln, and you just seem to really have a pulse on the sport. How do you keep in touch with the sport? How do you stay? current in the sport of wrestling what do you do to just kind of keep your passion for the sport alive um right i i kind of i i've gone in and out the last few years but uh right now i i'm i'm really i'm i'm back into the the wrestling world and and it, it's really started you know at, at high school uh, and then when i went to the university of iowa to 
I was a freshman at Iowa, and Randy Lewis was a freshman at Iowa. So, I mean, I was into the wrestling so much in high school, obviously, but then um, in college it was huge. But now it's just that there, there's a lot there's a lot of information out there, and, and the, these wrestlers are just so outstanding now, and the, the way these guys c- can compete. And uh, so I, I definitely I, I look online as much as I can. I read as much as I can about who's out there and, and what's going on. And it's just the, the, the amazing athletes, what I've seen, what these guys can do wrestling now. It's just it's incredible, and it's such an exciting sport. I, I just – hope that the growth continues because it's 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 really one of the sports that really needs to be celebrated in this country jay for for those of us that never had the opportunity what was it like watching wrestling in the old field house what are your recollections uh, of that in iowa city right that was great i remember um it was it was great uh the old field house um i remember at the big meet against uh, I don't know if it was Oklahoma State or Oklahoma. They had Doctor Death, the heavyweight, and the Bannock. I remember Lou Bannock. Um, it was just a packed field. I was Lou Bannock, like just picking this guy up in the air and like throwing him right down the mat and pinning him. And just the how crazy and loud it used to get in the, the old field house. I, I was telling um, Coach Gable a little earlier that I remembered. Um, in 72 or 73, I, I'm not sure what the year may have been, but when Iowa and Michigan wrestled, it was like, uh, I think Iowa was number two in the country and Michigan was number one, and this was the big match. And my high school coach, Clyde Bean, was the referee uh, of, of, of the match, and he disqualified an Iowa wrestler during the match for, like, swearing or something, and, and it cost Iowa the meat. And so, I mean, that, here's my high school coach, you know, and, and, and on top of it, the head coach at Iowa at the time was Gary Kirtlemeyer, and Dan was the assistant. And uh, Gary Kirtlemeyer, his son was a, my teammate on the high school wrestling team. And I'm sitting there watching the meet with Steve Kirtlemeyer, where our coach, you know, DQ's an <laughs> Iowa guy in the one or two. I mean, it was like, I go, Steve, you're going to you're gonna go to practice tomorrow? He, 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 uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. You were part of uh, the Iowa football program in, in the late 70s, right around when Hayden Fry came in. Correct. Uh, two decades of non-winning seasons prior to that in the program has uh, been on a pretty good roll ever since. Right. What did it take to change the culture of, of a program that had been downtrodden for so yeah. long? Right. I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I was there. Bob Cummings was the coach, and uh, Bob Cummings was a former player at Iowa. And uh, I, I really liked what how Bob Cummings, he was a great coach. He taught he taught us how to play with, with pride and intensity. And um, when Hayden came to Iowa, though, you could really see just a big shift in, in a way uh, things were organized and how practices were run and, yeah, and I, and I think also I think the university made a new commitment to the football program after they hired Hayden Fry, and um, Hayden had a, a big vision. Yeah, I think that was the big thing, and, and they they Bump Elliott and Bob Bowlesby allowed him to roll that out, that that vision of, of how to be successful, and um, it was Hayden did has done a super job. He did a great job at Iowa. It's, it's so fun to see how Kirk Ferentz has picked it up and. Um, See really, really where this Iowa football program's out. It's it's, you know, I go to as many games as I can, and um, it's just um, that Kinnick Stadium is ramped up like it's a it's an amazing. I talk to guys nowadays, you know, they're out of the NFL and stuff, and they always talk about, you know, one of their favorite places to ever play is Kinnick Stadium because you know those fans are just right on top of you in that stadium. So it's it's a very memorable place to play. Appreciate you being our headline celebrity. Great to have you out here. What an honor to have you with great credentials. But just to know that you're really tied to the sport of wrestling and appreciate what the sport of wrestling has done for you. I know that we appreciate that. Thanks for taking the time here on our podcast on the mat. Well, thank you. I, I, I feel a little foolish like being the headline celebrity at a wrestling thing because, you know, I was only a state runner-up when you know, all these national champions are around here. So, But I know this is one place not to pick a fight today. So. <laughs> Thanks so much. Our final guest, Matt Kroll. We could talk about you playing at the University of Iowa. We could talk about you going to the NFL. But at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament, what matters is you are a state wrestling champion. 
we just had on Jay Hilgenberg talking about how wrestling influenced him in the NFL and his college playing days. How much did wrestling influence you and your ability to play in the NFL? I think uh, everything. You know, I, Mike, my coach in the NFL level was Coach Rex Ryan, and uh, he had multiple players, and that's who he recruited, or I guess not recruited at the NFL level. That's what he drafted at the NFL level was ex-wrestlers. I just believe that everything you learn as far as uh, balance, you know, pad level, you know, hip level, hip strength, it all translated to the tackle game in his defense so that's what he uh, honestly looked for and so definitely helped me uh, being able to transition to that next level and that's what he looked for so it always helped. Was there ever a hard choice to what you were going to stick with of course <laughs> parlaying that into an NFL career leads to a, a lucrative side financially but did you ever miss wrestling thinking that might uh, take you somewhere? I still miss it to this day honestly I still uh, try and get in a high school wrestling room as much as I can so it's one of those sports that once you do it um, it sticks with you for your life. Um, I don't even really kind of walk around the field of football field, more or less. I have more time in the winter, and I get in the room and, and roll around just because something that's in your blood, and, and you always miss it. So, um, you know, obviously it would have been fun to wrestle in, at the college level, but with the scholarship situation with football, you know, he's kind of took that path, but uh, definitely miss it. You were with the Jets during the Hard Knocks season, weren't you? I was. That was the, the first, uh, what, 2012 or 10? The Jets I think Hard 2010. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was that like? It was funny, I mean, because it was Coach Ryan's first year, too, right? So, I mean, Coach Ryan's kind of unfiltered, says whatever the heck he wants to say. So it's kind of <laughs> cool to see, as a he's definitely a player's coach, and to have the world to see that, you know, it was a different different deal. That was the snack season, right? The that snack was snacks. Comment? Yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> snacks. That was, let's go get the effing snack. And, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty epic, so it was fun. We, we glorify the NFL for good reasons. It's a, an incredibly hard sport, a lot of combat, very... Uh, very precise sport what's it like being in the trenches being in the nfl trying to to scrap for a spot on an nfl roster i mean it's uh it's a business you know first and foremost but uh there's some very gifted individuals from athletic size standpoint um you know me being barely six two if that you know struggle in the way 310 you got guys that are six five that walk around at 310 that can run a four six and can touch this wall that's 10 feet away you know, their arms are that long and that's uh, length is such a big thing so wrestling did so much for me to to uh handle those guys i guess to even compete to even be on the same field as those guys but that's just to say there's some there's some gifted guys out there that can, that are special special humans athletically so i would uh pay a million bucks to be about six four but that's not what i, w I was with so um but it was fun you were when you were with the Hawkeyes, there were a bunch of guys that were state championship caliber wrestlers, right? Yep. I mean, I think you wrestled Mike Humple one year in the state tournament. Yeah, thanks for I'm... bringing that up. Yeah, that's why I got third. <laughs> yeah, he beat me in the quarter, so I got third place that year. Thanks. Yeah. Did, uh, did there ever, were there any living room matches? Were there any backyard matches that took place? We always those joked days? about it, right, to get a tournament together because we had Canellis, Alice Canellis, we had Travis Mead. We had Etour Ewan, a Florida State champ. Humple was there two time. I was. A, we always talked about having, like just around, <laughs> like before practice. There were. I'm sure there was a couple of skirmishes in the because I lived with Humple. Uh, he's my roommate for a couple of years, so there definitely were some living room uh, matches. But before we broke any walls or we got hurt, <laughs> we kind of backed off that that uh, note. But you mentioned football being a profession, a business. When it is a business like that, are you focused on the Super Bowl? Is that the end game, or is it more, I'm just focused on my position. I want to do the best job I can in what I'm given task to do. I think it both comes into play. Um, you have the way the preseason set up, the way the offseason set up. You are literally fighting to get to that 53-man. You know, that is your goal, obviously. I mean, that's everyone's. Besides the top 10% that are, you know, have a thing signed, they know their spot. There's that lower say 50, 60% of that roster that literally your goal is to get on 53. And then once that goes, then yeah, you, you translate. It's everyone's goal to win the Super Bowl. I think Coach Ryan did one thing uh, before the playoffs. My first year, he said, raise your hand if you want a Super Bowl. And it was like one person out of the 61 guys. You know, it was like LaDainian Thomason, maybe one at that point. Um, but it doesn't happen. So, it, I mean, it's everyone's goal to win the Super Bowl. Um, like I said, just kind of how it translates to the season, your goals change. So. Do you follow wrestling pretty close? I try to. You know, it was fun to get down to Iowa City, watch those world team trials, our world team event this uh, this past, uh, what, a couple months ago. That was fun to see. Um, you, know, you know, you guys do a great job of putting stuff out on the social media stuff. So I try to, um, but it was tough, yeah. 
And I still talk to, you know, Metcalf. We see each other quite a bit through some of the hunting stuff and kind of stay up to date with him. And it's been fun to watch some of those guys go. Compare and contrast football and wrestling. You did a little bit, but uh, which is harder, which is more demanding? The mental side, just kind of compare and contrast because it's a unique uh, sport. It's unique. I think uh, D-line is very similar because it's you and that old lineman. You know, just like a wrestling match, it's you and another guy. And tough, and this is such a huge thing, and mental fortitude. Um, very similar, but wrestlers, man, people ask me all the time. This question you asked me in the beginning, why didn't you wrestle? I'm like, wrestlers got... There's something loose. There's something loose in their head. Some of those college wrestlers, man, because you, it's such a physical, intense sport, and you have to be on every time you step in that mat in that practice room. And I have no idea in the practice room and on the in the mat at the collegiate level. If you're not on the game mentally, you know you can tell the difference. It's still crazy to me to see, even at the college level, the difference in an athlete who takes say his top five percent of that, and a guy who's just a guy wrestling. It's crazy to to kind of see that difference, and it's all the mental game. You know, guys are all skilled. But guys that can stick with it day after day, you know, I think uh, wrestling, I'm not going to say by far, but it's just a tougher, tougher deal. Matt Kroll, state wrestling champion who went on to the NFL. Thanks for joining us. This has been fun being at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament. For Andy Hamilton, I'm Kyle Klingman. You've been listening to On the Mat. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.